알겠습니다. 어떻게 언론이 정직함을 유지하면서 제대로 보도할 수 있을까? 정직함에 대한 정, 그 질문들이 있었는데 제가 사전에 한번 여쭤봤어요. 정직함에 대한 선생님의 생각을 여쭤봤는데 두 가지 레벨에서 말씀하셨습니다. 첫 번째 정직함이라는 것은 You said before 어, 아버지한테 집에서 배우는 부모님한테 배우는 그런 종류의 정직함이 있고요. 또 하나는 이제 사회에 나와서 지금 방금 말씀하신 intellectual honesty라는 말씀을 하셨습니다. 그러니까 지적인 정직함을 우리는 획득해야 한다. 그러니까 기자들, 기자라는 직업이 그 지적인 정직함을 추구하면서 치열하게 그것이 무엇인지 고민해야 하는 뭐 거짓말을 하나 안 하나 이런 차원의 거짓말이 아니라 그런 차원의 고민이 아니라 그런 말씀을 해주셨고요. 그 그런 부분은 사실은 뭐 나라와 문화와 관계없이 또 디지털과 아날로그와 관계없이 관통하는 어떤 저널리즘의 기본 덕목이 아닌가 생각을 합니다. 오늘 주제가 디지털 시대의 언론인의 윤리입니다. 그래서 이제, 이제 디지털로 좀 넘어와 볼까 합니다. 디지털 관련해서 많은 그 이야기들을 할수 있을 것 같고 또 질문도 많이 있었습니다. 여러 질문이 있는데 우선 이제 아까 스피치에서 여러 그 half full version and half empty version. And I'd like to ask you, 아, 죄송합니다. <웃음> 그 중에서 가장 큰 위협은 무엇이고 가장 큰 기회는 무엇인지 그거 좀, 그게 좀 듣고 싶어요. 많은 말씀을 하셨는데 선생님께서 생각하시는 그래도 좀 중요한 부분을 정리해서 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Before I answer that, I just want to also amplify a little bit the point when we had our conversation yesterday about two types of honesty. One type of honesty is your basic character. And this is something that hopefully you learn from your parents or from your teachers or from the minister at your church. Um, and that's the kind of honesty that says you don't steal your brother's allowance money. Um, you don't do what I did in high school, which is put a dent in your father's car and instead of telling him you did it, try to paint it over and hide it. Um, those are basic kinds of honesty in your character. But, that, but you could be someone who won't steal your brother's allowance and won't lie about putting a dent in the car and still not be intellectually honest as a journalist. As I was suggesting before, has to do with being able to, at times, separate yourself from your own beliefs. A good example is if you take some of the issues that are very divisive in American society, like should abortion be illegal or not? Um, should there be gun control laws or not? Those are issues that really divide the country almost in half or two thirds to one third. And if you're going to be an ethical journalist, even if you're in favor of abortion rights, you have to be able to go out and cover a rally that wants to make abortion illegal and treat the people at that rally honestly. Not just quote them accurately, but take their point of view seriously. And the same thing, if you're someone who loves to go hunting and likes to collect guns and thinks that guns are protected by the Second Amendment of the Constitution, and you get sent as a journalist to cover a rally by students like the students in Florida who had a mass shooting at their school, demanding very strict gun control, you have to be able to separate your own point of view from theirs. And there's one final level, and I'll get to the social media part, which is that it's also important to be an ethical journalist not to engage in what I call false equivalency. It is a very high journalistic value to look at both sides or many sides of an issue. But not every issue has two sides. When people, even if it's in public political life, say the people of this race are inferior to another race, that's not an issue with two legitimate points of view. And if you treat it with on the one hand, on the other hand, then you're actually distorting it. Or climate change. You see often American journalists who are not really knowledgeable about science, if they write about climate change, they talk about the scientists who say there is human-caused climate change, and then they'll quote the ones who say, no, this is just a natural cycle. But that's a distortion, that's a false equivalency, because among climate scientists around the world, the overwhelming majority, well over 90%, say it's caused by human activity. 
If you write about that 50% pro, 50% con, you're not being accurate. You may think you're being fair. You're actually being very inaccurate. So having said that, now to some of the challenges of ethics in the digital era. I talked about a couple of them before. The challenge of verifying. Um, the challenge of, um, of resisting the urge to just stay in your own political or ideological corner or just with people of your own gender or, or just with people of your own religion, all these different sub-communities that exist, um, especially online. But I want to point, bring up one other point that actually I'd meant to include in my speech, but the text was finished by the time it occurred to me, which is a lot of journalists now get very mixed messages from their newsroom executives. On the one hand, they're told, we want you to have a Twitter account, we want you to be on Facebook, we want you to have a social media platform, and we want you to use it to be part of the public conversation, to promote your work so that people will see our news organization's work on your Twitter feed and start paying attention to our publication as a whole. And on the other hand, these journalists are said, but you can't do anything that is too opinionated or makes it look like you have a bias or is too snarky and insulting to someone else. I think that actually journalists are, I feel very sympathetic to the ones who later get disciplined or reprimanded because many news organizations have been way too slow to develop policies about social media use. But even though I criticize a lot of journalistic managers for that failure, I also think there's still a lot of personal responsibility that belongs to the individual journalist. And what I would say to you, and this is one of the big challenges of the digital era, is that you cannot think that there is a dividing line between your public life as a journalist and your private life as expressed on social media anymore. There is no such line. Everything you put out in social media will be interpreted by the people who follow your journalism as being reflective of you as a journalist and of being reflective of your news organization. You can't say, oh, I didn't mean it. You can't say, oh, that's just my personal account because it's all searchable now. And we know even if you try to delete the tweet, it will be found. Even if you want to say that photo of me giving the Nazi salute at some event, I was just goofing around. That is impossible anymore. And look, we all make momentary mistakes, but I'm a big believer in what my wife calls the 30-second rule. The 30-second rule is when you're starting to get ready to write something or post something online, wait 30 seconds and then think about whether you want this to be part of your life for the rest of your life, because it will be. I'm not talking about things you did in high school. I think there is a forgiveness. But once you have started to be a journalist, whether that's in college or after college, everything you put out there is going to be part of how you are assessed as a journalist and whether people think they can trust you. When I go to interview people now, they've checked me out on social media to decide whether they want to give me an interview or not. And that's going to be more and more common. So I think it's hugely important for you to think about that. And I'll say one last thing. So, um, there was a recent incident, the new, actually I'll spare the details, but the larger point I want to make is sometimes journalists who get drawn into you know, Twitter storms you know, and flaming with people, readers who are attacking them, say things they regret. And then when they're called to account about why, if you're one of our reporters, did you say blah, blah, blah. I mean, for instance, there's an excellent journalist in the United States named Julia Iafi. She got very mad because a bunch of Donald Trump supporters were, you know, going after her, were trolling her. They, because she's Jewish, they were sending her cartoons of her dressed like a concentration camp inmate. And so she got so mad, she put out a tweet saying, I think Donald Trump 
must be sleeping with his daughter Ivanka. They must have an incestuous relationship, which was a disgusting and unforgivable thing to say. And her explanation initially was, well, I was being trolled. I just fought back. And I'm sorry, that is not a legitimate excuse for us anymore. There is no law of nature that if someone trolls you, you have to say anything back to them. There is no law of nature that says that even if someone goes after you because of your religion, your race, your nationality, you have to get into the gutter with them. Um, and I just really want to urge that on you because you as young people who've grown up in the digital era who feel like somehow there's a magic line between your public self and your private self need to be aware that no such line exists.